very much. I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm sorry to have missed the meeting a year and a half ago in La Jolla where, when we were having a snowpocalypse in Boston. Uh, we'd much rather have been in La Jolla for that meeting, but happy to uh, give a report on um, really how transformative the uh, Allen Foundation support has been to our laboratory, which has been interested for a long time in the genetics of developmental disorders of the human brain, uh, but uh, was allowed uh, through the uh, grant that we had that is just now uh, reaching its end to uh, um, in enlarge our focus to really focus on parts of the human genome that looks like they might uh, have played important roles uh, in recent uh, brain evolution. So uh, I'll sort of tell you the story of how this grant uh, affected the work in the lab sort of historically. We've been working for a long time uh, on recessive disorders that disrupt brain development or function. And over the years, uh, we're interested in autism spectrum disorders, which uh, involve social defects and intellectual defects. And we're interested, uh, because this is such a genetically heterogeneous condition, there are hundreds or probably thousands of different genes that can be disrupted to result in autism spectrum disorders. Uh, we collected families that um, came from pedigrees where the parents were cousins, consanguineous marriages, and these are very common in the Arabic countries of Northern Africa and the Middle East, obviously very rare in the United States where the prevalence of uh, consanguinity is less than 1%. Uh, and so we thought this might be a way of enriching for recessive mutations. If a kid in Riyadh goes to a genetics clinic with a genetic disorder, it's virtually always recessive and virtually always because of the fact that his parents are first cousins and is likely to be something that has recurred in his family because the typical family size has six kids and um, oftentimes multiple nuclear families from a single father. Um, and so um, this allows us to do homozygosity mapping. Uh, not only does it enrich for recessive mutations, but it allows the, them to be found relatively easily because you can trace the uh, segment in the genome that's been inherited in that child from the common grandfather or grandmother, uh, and you can trace it through the family and localize the part of the genome that's likely to carry the mutation. Uh, and so over the years, we've collected over 200 autism pedigrees with parental consanguinity, most of them just a single affected child and uh, cousin parents, but uh, some of them with multiple affected individuals. And as we studied these families, we found that they had some sorts of genetic mutations similar to what we see in the United States and others that are quite distinctive. So they have these things, uh, kids with autism often have things, things called copy number variations, which are deletions or duplications of the genome. This would be a reference chromosome. This would be a duplication of segment C. That would be a loss of segment C. And this is what a kid uh, from Turkey looks like. He has a loss of one of the two copies of this segment of the chromosome, which is why the color is fainter. And his parents are normal. So this is a spontaneous or a de novo copy number variant, which is heterozygous. He's got a good chromosome and then a deleted uh, portion. And this is a common sort of thing. It causes 3 or 4% of autism in the United States. But uh, in families, and the fact that the parents are related is irrelevant. It's a spontaneous mutation that occurred in either a sperm or an egg. But then, uh, and these tend to be very large with maybe 30 genes or so uh, deleted. But uh, children who are, whose parents are related, here again the father's mother and the mother's father are siblings, so the parents are first cousins. In this case, an affected boy has an inherited copy number variant. Actually, the father has it, the mother has it, the unaffected sister has it, but in fact, the boy has uh, inherited two deleted copies, so he's completely missing a segment of his genome. So we call these copy number uh, zero, or CNV zeros for short, and they tend to be much smaller and will either have just a couple of genes or most commonly no genes at all. So there will be a piece of the genome missing, but no exons are in that deletion. And uh, so this is what, this, again, if you look at American families, this is published results, these spontaneous copy number variants are about three times more common in cases than controls. In the Middle East, where um, the parents are, relate, are closely related, in fact, you don't see that many of these, co these spontaneous copy number variants. You occasionally see them, but they're barely more common in cases than they are in unaffected siblings. Although if you find families from the Middle East where the parents are not very co closely related, then you see the expected excess. But what you see is a lot of these copy number variant zeros. So families from the Middle East where the parents are closely related, about 20% of the cases have these homozygous deletions and very few of the controls. So there's about a, a, a threefold, fourfold excess of these CNV zeros. And this is limited to the families where the parents are closely related and not seen where the parents are um, less closely related. And in fact, um, families in the United States where there's more than one affected kid, that
they look like they also have a slight excess of these copy number variant zero. So we think that they can happen anywhere, although they're obviously enriched uh, in families where the parents are related. Now, if you look at these, copy, these CNV zeros, um, about a quarter of them delete exons, but most of them delete uh, non-coding DNA that have marks of promoters or enhancers, suggesting that they're regulatory mutations. Uh, in fact, this overlap with promoter and enhancer marks is very unlikely to be coincidence. Uh, and here's an example. This is a gene SCN7A, which is a sodium uh, channel uh, that regulates vasopressin and oxytocin release. And this uh, H3K27 mon uh, methylation reflects promoter marks, and that's actually not neatly deleted by this deletion associated with autism spectrum disorders. And these are known to impair gene expression. And so this implies that there's some part of autism that's due to these non-coding mutations that don't disrupt proteins, but instead disrupt these regulatory regions that express, that control where and when and how a gene is expressed. And so, in fact, uh, three out of these 28 CNV zeros deleted these things called human accelerated regions, which are thought to be evolutionarily very dynamic. Human accelerated regions are genomic regions that are thought to include areas that might be targets of recent evolutionary selection. And they tend to be highly conserved in many mammals, but then divergent between humans and other mammals, which is why they're called accelerated. And most of them are non-coding. Most of them look like they're, uh, they serve as an gene enhancers. And so this is a neutral part of the genome that shows about the same rate of substitutions in all species. Here's something that shows extreme mammalian conservation. That implies that it's functional and uh, that any sort of variation is probably deleterious. And then HARS, or human accelerated regions, are conserved in non-humans, but then show variation in humans compared to other species. That implies one of two things, either a conserved function that's a little different in humans than other species, or it might mean that, in fact, this segment is really important to non-humans and then has lost its essential function, has just sort of accumulated a lot of um, garbage in the human because it's not functional. And so how do we distinguish those two possibilities? Well, what we do is we can directly test which HARs are essential in humans. And if they're essential, then we should be able to find mutations that disrupt them that cause a disease. Uh, and so if we do, we can, we can look at those HARs then that have essential functions and think about what kinds of functions do they have in humans. And so this was the time uh, when the Allen Foundation grant started. We knew that there was likely to be a signal of non-coding variation in autism spectrum disorders. We knew that our consanguineous families were likely to be able to tell us about it. But we, weren't, we wouldn't have been bold enough to actually go out and, and sequence these HARs uh, unless we had had um, an, an agreement with them and a grant to specifically support it. And boy, are we really glad we did because we were really thrilled about the results. And so this suggests that maybe HAR mutations might help us recognize what parts of the genome are not only essential to regulate social and cognitive behavior, but maybe identify those same HARs that might have changed just a little bit to play some role in completely changing the social behavior of humans compared to other species, and as well as, of course, the intellectual and cognitive behavior. And this is work that was just recently published, uh, work led by Ryan Doan, a postdoctoral fellow. So he sequenced all 2,700 HARs in these 200 families, either by looking at whole genome sequence that we already had or by developing a har -ohm panel analogous to an exome panel, but it's much smaller, and found that, indeed, there's this uh, excess of rare homozygous HAR mutations in cases compared to unaffected controls, about a 5% excess. And then if you look at the, the HARs that actually have marks that suggest that they're enhancers in the brain, that excess goes up. It's much stronger. And then if you look at those HARs that look like they function outside the brain, in fact, there's no excess, suggesting that this excess is largely driven by uh, those HARs that are neural or brain enhancers. And we think it actually makes up about 5% of the families. And so since not all of the rare HAR mutations are likely to be causative, we focused on those that uh, connected. We then uh, connected the HARs to their target genes to try to figure out ones, which ones were the most likely to be important. So here's an example of a rare HAR mutation in HAR number 426. It's a G to A substitution. This particular HAR has marks of being open chromatin. It's embedded in a large area that has marks of being an enhancer. And then we use published 4C sequencing, which allows you to connect enhancers directly to promoters to find that this gene, this enhancer, connects not to the closest gene, but to a gene that's 200 kilobases away called Cux1. And this in mutation was found in two actually independent families. Uh, it, has a, a, it has some prevalence, but extremely low, uh, less than one in 200 in normal people. 
And so this mutation is indeed in an enhancer sequence. You can take the sequence and put it in a, a luciferase assay and show that there's enhancer activity. And surprisingly, the mutation doesn't disrupt that activity. It supercharges it. So the enhancer is actually more than twice as effective or twice as strong um, in, uh, with the mutation, with the disease-associated mutation. And you see the disease-associated mutation creates binding sites for transcription factors that don't bind the normal enhancer. We were surprised by this, so we actually took it and put it into a transgenic mouse, and it serves as an enhancer in a transgenic mouse. And if you create the human mutation, the neurons get even brighter, so that in fact it is a strong, the mutation confers stronger enhancer activity uh, in mice. And um, in fact, this gene, Cux1, is a hom human homologue of one of the classic dosage-sensitive genes that have been described in flies. If you uh, knock it out, the dendrites get simpler. If you overexpress it, the dendrites get more complex. And in fact, even among different normal neurons throughout the fly nervous system, there's a correlation between how complex the dendrites are and the native levels of expression of cut. And the same is true in mice. It's expressed in the upper layers of the cortex, which are the most recently evolved among mammals. And then there's the same dosage uh, relationship so that if you deplete it, the dendrites get simpler. And if you overexpress it, the dendrites get more complicated. So it looks like throughout evolution, cuck and cucks, cut in flies and cucks in mammals is extremely dosage sensitive and may be utilized in many ways to regulate the, the sizes of neurons. Here's another harm mutation. This one's a more dramatic uh, change. It deletes about five base pairs from an enhancer and removes actually a predicted binding site for a neuronal immediate early gene called Eager 3. Uh, it's again in the middle of what looks like an enhancer by its histone marks. It again, uh, we did our own 4C sequencing here to connect this HAR to its target gene, which again was not the closest gene, but the second closest gene called PTBP2. This has enhancer activity, and the mutation disrupts its enhancer activity in non-dividing neuron-like cells, but not in dividing cells. And so it's almost like this is a neuron-specific or a conditional mutation specific to neurons. And in fact, that mutation, a conditional mutation of PTBP2 in neurons only, has been made in mice and actually causes the neurons to degenerate. Uh, and so PTBP2 loss in neurons is known to be toxic to neurons. Here's a horror which in two different, and, and by the way, that, that previous HAR was com is completely absent in normals. This is another uh, case. Two independent families have two different mutations that are actually in the same HAR, and neither of these mutations are seen in any normals that we have found, either Middle Eastern or European. Uh, and they affect the same HAR, which is actually an intron of a gene called GPC4, uh, which encodes glipocamp 4, which has been shown to be essential for the development of excitatory synapses uh, in the hippocampus. Now, do HAR mutations play roles in autism in America and non-consanguineous families? We took a quick look at that by looking at the strongest possible mutations, these de novo copy number variants. I told you they're three times as common in cases than they are in controls in the United States of America. So we asked, do copy number variants that contain HARs, are they more common in cases than controls? In fact, they're six times as common, those uh, copy number variants that contain uh, HARs. Uh, most of these to, uh, copy number variants, as I told you, are really big. They, can, they take out lots of different genes, and so we can't say that the HAR is the thing that's causing the phenotype. There's only a couple of them that delete HARs and don't delete exons as well, but enough to make us think that there's probably at least some contribution to families in the United States. I'll skip this in the interest of time. This just illustrates another example. Uh, and so now we feel like we can start to think about how we have a method for defining those HARs that have essential human uh, roles, and figuring out what sorts of roles do they have. Do they uh, influence intelligence? Do they influence social behavior? Uh, both. And then what are the mechanisms that are involved in these evolutionary changes? Looks like synaptic spine density is important. Interneuron development is probably important uh, on the basis of a HAR that I didn't show you. Uh, and so uh, we, we are only scratching the surface of the 2,700 HARs. We look like we've identified about a dozen or so that might be important. Uh, but we feel like now we have a cheap way of sequencing the HAR uh, and so we can then potentially sequence thousands of patients, and that's what we're doing now, looking for the, the variety of HAR mutations, looking for recurrent mutations in the same HAR in different families, and then also using higher throughput ways of studying not only the disease-associated mutation, but the evolutionary-associated changes to see how they alter the effects of the enhancer for those that are enhancers. And then also systematically linking those HARs to their target genes using these chromatin capture methodologies. 
I'll stop there and I'm happy to answer questions. The HAR work was uh, led by Ryan Doan and byung Il and Marta helped with the Cux analysis. This um, cohort of uh, consanguineous patients has been studied over years and I, I should say they've all been subjected to exon sequencing as well and so we focused also our attention on those families that did not have other explanatory mutations before we would assume that the mutation was non-coding. The CNV0 work was done by Klaus Schmitzabe in collaboration with Kyriakos Markianos' lab. So thanks very much. To begin with, you, you made the uh, initial diagnosis of a HAR by comparing it to, to the other great apes, right? The genomes across the great apes. Uh -huh. So now that you've identified those that have functionality, have you gone back to thinking about what it is that they may have played as the role in, in terms of the speciation of, of humans? So uh, we would like to, but we have not, no. And most, I should say most of the HARs have been, dis we have not discovered the HARs. The, scars, the HARs were discovered by several other people. Uh, you know, first David Hausler and uh, Pollard and several mm -hmm. different people. So we've just sort of collected the, you know, the universe of... of well, in the case of Cux, for example, do you yeah. have any hypothesis as to what may have happened with that Cux har? Is it get, get, get given humans greater branching of dendrites relative to so great apes? Do you right, think exactly. that might be a case? Or yeah, so the simple experiment that for some reason we haven't already done is to compare the transcriptional activity of the primate har sequence and the human. Uh, and I'm not, and we, we, again, we were just focusing on the, we, we, our first thing was to validate that it's actually a mutation, there's plausibly a, a mutation based on some physiological role. And I don't know if people have done that experiment, we haven't reviewed it, but that's the next thing, is to, be, and we'd like to do this in a high throughput way, so we can take the HAR, the HAR sequence and a whole bunch of different animals and put them in the same uh, sort of assay uh, and then compare them yeah. uh, in a high throughput yeah. way rather than, yeah. because these assays are very low throughput. Right. Several years ago, I had I gave a lecture uh, about animals and uh, their role in understanding human uh, pathology. So I was talking about cancer, of course, and, and there was a speaker talking about behavioral abnormalities in dogs, and there are apparently breeds of dogs that have autistic behavior. And I wonder if they have DARS or <laughs> HARS or whatever. Well, I mean, there are a lot of things that can cause autism, as I said, you know. Yeah. Coding, re coding sequence mutations in the exons are probably, probably more common than non-coding mutations, although in these consanguineous families, I'm not so sure, uh, because it looks like the, there's about, it might be about 50-50. Yeah. Uh, but so there are so many things that can cause to autism. I'd look in the coding sequence first, and then if I didn't find something, I mean, that would be a, that these sort of founder mutations in dogs would be good candidates for a non-coding mutation. Of yeah. Do you, do you find behavioral abnormalities in the mice when you put these mutations in? Are any of the HARs that are in enhancers actually um, transcribed as eRNAs, the enhancer RNAs? And if so, would they then also have a regulatory role? Hars are very heterogeneous, and so again, uh, there, and there's a lot of them. So I don't, I, I'm, so I assume that there are some that are transcribed. Some some Hars are in, you know, uh, link RNAs or micro RNAs. Uh, so a couple of them are in exons actually, and so they are all over the place. But they're most commonly in about 45% uh, of them have marks of neural enhancers. Uh, about 40% of them have marks of cardiac enhancers or something like that. And so I assume that some of those have, you know, ERNAs, but I haven't really systematically looked. Jay? You can't, you can't tell for sure. I mean, you're, you're, the bulk of your signal is coming from the intersection of HARS with neural enhancers, right? Correct. It's, so right. have you thought about just extending to all neural enhancers for the resequencing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, in fact, so our, in our resequencing, we've actually... Uh, it's in some ways uh, ironic that we started with HARS since they're less highly conserved than other neural enhancers. There, uh, there are some, hand, it, and so our next panel is a HAR plus panel that has, you know, the HARS plus the most highly conserved neural enhancers, which in fact are more likely targets for disease than the HARS are. Uh, and yep. uh, but the, and and I so I expect, in fact, if you sequence neural enhancers that are absolutely conserved between mice and humans, you'd probably see a stronger effect size. Uh, and so we thought we'd put them in as well. Thank you. Yeah,